نحمد رسول کریم اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم رب شخلی صدری و یسرلی امری واحل العقدتم من لسانی یفقہ قولی و جعلی وزیر من اخلی اللہ فکنا بدین رب زدنی علما اللہ الحم نہ رشتن و عائز نہ من شروری انفسنا اللہ ارین الحق حق اور ذکن تبا اللہ ارین الباطل باطل اور ذکن جتنابا آمین سم آمین السلام علیکم و رحمۃ اللہ وبرکاتہ سورت النساء ورس ففٹی ایٹ اللہ سبحانہ و تعالیٰ سیز ان اللہ یا مرکم ان ڈیڈ اللہ کمانڈس یو اللہ کمانڈس یو ٹو رینڈر ٹرسٹس ٹو ہوم دے آر ڈیو اینڈ وین یو جج بٹوین پیپل ٹو جج ود جسٹس ایکسلنٹ از دیٹ وچ اللہ instructs you indeed Allah is ever hearing and seeing in verse number 58 Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is making a special instruction in fact here the Muslims are being forewarned that they should avoid all those all those evil things which people of Bani Israel were involved in the basic error during the degeneration of the people of Bani Israel was that they had started entrusting the positions of trust to the incompetent people they began to entrust positions of responsibility and religious and political leaderships to people who were inefficient narrow-minded, immoral, dishonest, and wicked people. So what happened actually as a result was that the whole community became corrupt. So the Muslims are being cautioned against this evil. And the Muslims are being enjoined to entrust positions of responsibility to qualified and competent people of good moral character, righteous people, pious people, God-fearing people, believers who are actually fearing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To uh, revise again, I would uh, mention that when I started discussion of Surah Tunisa, I said that the orders of Surah Tunisa will be in four stages. The first circle of we talked about was a Muslim home and then till now we've been talking about orders regarding a Muslim community and a Muslim society. From here onwards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be giving the rules, the regulations, the laws, the um, different instructions and guidances for a Muslim state. That is how a Muslim state is supposed to make their rules and regulations and laws according to the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Verse number 59, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, O you who have believed, obey Allah and obey the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and those in authority among you. And if you disagree over anything, then refer it to Allah and the Messenger if you should believe in Allah and the last day. That is the best way and best in result. So one of a very good instructions as far as the better result and better outcomes is concerned, Allah is in fact in this verse giving the basis of the whole of the religious, the cultural and the political system of Islam in an Islamic, in an Islamic state. In an Islamic state or in an Islamic system, Allah is the real authority who must be obeyed as a primary priority. 
So a Muslim is first of all the servant of Allah and then other capacities come after this. So as Muslim as an individual and Muslims as a community owe their first loyalty to Allah. As Prophet says in a hadith that there is no obedience to any of his creatures in what involves disobedience to the creator. So Allah's creations and Allah's bondsmen will not be obeyed if it is involving the disobedience of the creator himself. So the primary obedience, the primary submission, the only first surrendering is to whom? To Allah Azza wa Jal. The secondary and the second obedience is to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Whoever obeys me, obeys Allah, and whoever disobeys me, disobeys Allah. So for the Muslim individuals and for the Muslims in a state, the first obedience is of Allah and the second line of obedience is of Prophet ﷺ. And then after the first and the second is, in this verse Allah is explaining, after the first and the second line of obedience, the third line of obedience will be of those who have been invested with authority from among the Muslims themselves. And here Allah is calling them as Ulil Amr. Who are the Ulil Amr? They can be the Muslim religious scholars, the thinkers, the political leaders, administrators, judges of the law courts, the tribal chiefs, and likewise. So what in this verse, what Allah is basically saying that after obeying the orders and the commandments of Allah and his messenger as the primary and the secondary priority, the tertiary priority will be to obey the Ulil Amr. And this will be provided only, number one, when they are from among the Muslims and number two, when they themselves are obedient to Allah and his messenger. That is, they themselves are doing what? Atiullah wa ati Rasul. Then only will be the Ulul Amr be obeyed. There are so many traditions of the Prophet ﷺ which explain the concept in a greater detail. Bukhari and Muslim uh, hadith is narrated that Prophet ﷺ said that it is obligatory on a Muslim to listen and to obey the orders of those invested with authority, whether he likes it or he dislikes it. Our liking or disliking is actually not important, whether he likes it or dislikes it, provided that it is not sinful. However, if he is, if he is ordered to do a sinful thing, he should neither listen to the ruler nor obey their orders. So this is the concept and this is the primary and the secondary and the tertiary orders of obedience and the merits how we have to go about the obedience uh, of the Ulil Amr. Then in another hadith of Bukhari and Muslim, Prophet ﷺ said, Obedience to anyone in a sinful thing is forbidden. Obedience is obligatory only what is right. So what Allah and the Prophet ﷺ do not say is right and Quran and Hadith says is a sin will not be obeyed. Similarly, there is another hadith of Prophet ﷺ which was reported in Muslim that Prophet ﷺ said, There will be rulers over you. There will be rulers over you who will practice right things as well as wrong things. In such a case, whoever protests against the wrong things shall be absolved from the responsibility and whoever dislikes the wrong things also shall escape the punishment. But whoever approves of and follows them, follows them what? The wrong deeds of the Ulil Amr. Whoever approves and follows them shall incur punishment. The companions asked, should we not fight against such rulers? Prophet Sallallahu answered, no, not as long as they offer Salah. Then in another hadith reported in Muslim, Prophet Sallallahu said, your worst rulers. 
your worst rulers are those whom you hate and who hate you whom you curse and who curse you the companions again asked then should we not rise against such rulers prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said no not as long as they establish salah not as long as they establish salah among them among you so this is the basic mannerism we are supposed to in an islamic in an islamic state go about the preferences and priorities of obedience first being allah the second line of obedience being the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and third line of obedience being the obedience of the ulil amr and this has been conditionally explained according to the hadith verse number 60 have you not seen those who claim to have believed in what was revealed to you o muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and what was revealed before you they wish to refer the legislation to taqud while they were commanded to reject it and shaitan wishes to lead them far astray now here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about the people who are referring the legislation to taqut. What do we mean by taqut? Taqut comes from the word taghi and taghi means to rebel or to revolt. So taqut is what Quran calls taqut is the name of all forms of authorities which tends to revolt or to be rebellious against the commandments of Quran or hadith so taqut will clearly be standing for the authority that makes decision against against the decisions of Quran and hadith being rebellious and revolting against the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so taqut can be in different forms you see sometimes the person's own nafs the person's own soul turns out to act like a taqut sometimes the family the the family the spouse the children come out as as the role of a taqut and then the society or the community the customs the norms they all sometimes they act or they behave like a taqut for a person and then the orders and the rules and the regulations and the laws in a state sometimes might be acting and behaving like taqut for the people of the state and sometime there might be leaders like the leaders of certain tribesmen who who might be giving orders which are like taqut so remember one if wants to be a true believer has to reject believing the taqut allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in surah al-baqarah ومن يغفر بالطاغوت ويؤمن بالله فقد استمسك بالعروة الوثقى anybody or any person who is going to refuse obeying and accepting the orders of taghut has got hold of a very good support فقد استمسك بالعروة الوثقى لا في صوام لها الله ولي الذين آمنوا يخرجونهم من الظلمات إلى النور والذين قفروا أولياء رحم الطاغوت يخرجونهم من النور إلى الظلمات الله says that the people who are the believers allah becomes a wali for them and then when allah becomes a wali for them he takes them out of the darkness and brings them into the light into the into the noor of education and literacy and in the noor of quran and all those people who are the disbelievers they are the friends of taghut and what does taghut do to all his friends he takes them out of the light to darkness allahumma ja'alni fi qalbi nura allahumma ja'alni fi qalbi nura allahumma ja'alni fi qalbi nura remember to believe allah one needs to reject 
and to refuse the commandments of Tagut. And a person who is accepting or who is taking the orders of Tagut will obviously be a disbeliever, refusing, rebelling against the commandments of Quran and Hadith. Then Allah says in verse number 61, And when it is said to them, Come to what Allah has revealed, and to the Messenger, وسلم, you see the hypocrites turning away from you in aversion. So now in verse number 61, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about a behavior of the hypocrites. And the hypocrites in the time of the Prophet ﷺ, they used to behave like this. But this is a behavior of hypocrites in all the periods till the day of resurrection. Allah says that hypocrites used to bring only such cases because you know that Prophet ﷺ was like the chief justice of Medina. So these hypocrites, they used to bring such cases before Prophet ﷺ as they used to think that it was likely to be decided in favor of them according to their desires and wishes. But if they thought and if they feared that the decision would be not would not would not be according to their desire or according to their wishes, then he used to refrain them, refrain bringing such cases to the Prophet <coughs> And this is exactly what hypocrites of all periods have been doing. Even today, we see that people are who are hypocrites, they are ever ready to submit to the decisions of uh, the Quran and Hadith. And when they, when the orders of Quran and Hadith, they go in their favor, in the favor of their desires and their wishes. But otherwise, if the orders of Quran or Sunnah or Hadith, they are contrary to their desires and interests, then they tend to stay away and they are averse to the teachings of Quran and Sunnah. Allahumma la taj'alla minhum. اللهم اتوحر قلبي من النفاق اللهم اتوحر قلبي من النفاق والله clear our souls clear our hearts from this evil evil condition of hypocrisy and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in verse number 62 so how will it be when disaster strikes them because of what their hands have put forth. And then they come up to you swearing by Allah that we intended nothing by good conduct and accommodation. Verse number 63, Allah says, those are the ones of whom Allah knows what is in their hearts. So turn away from them, but admonish them and speak to them a far reaching word. Verse number 64, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَا مِنْ رَسُولٍ إِلَّا لِيُطَاعَ بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ Allah says, We did not send any messenger. <coughs> Allah says, We did not send any messenger except to be obeyed by the permission of Allah. And if they... And if when they wronged themselves, they had come to you and asked forgiveness of Allah and Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had asked forgiveness for them, they would have found Allah accepting of repentance and merciful. In this verse 64 of Surah An-Nisa, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala is explaining the reason why Allah has been sending messengers or prophets towards different people in different times and different nations. Allah says that the prophets were not just sent, that people claim to have faith on them or people simply acknowledge them as messengers and people just announce and declare and highlight that they love them and they respect them and they regard them or they keep on in the love, in the respect and in the regard of the prophets, the followers. They just keep on arranging huge, huge Sira conferences or 
very extensive seminars or they keep on uh, having get togethers or they arrange gatherings to recite the rood or to recite poems praising the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam but when all these people doing all these activities and claiming and declaring and announcing and doing all these activities when they are asked to obey to obey what the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam has brought and what he actually taught they failed to obey they refuse to obey they reject they rebel and they do not accept the code of life the mode of ethics prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam brought and taught this was not the purpose the purpose of prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam being sent for all of us for all the followers the purpose of sending prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was that we obey we obey we adopt we accept the code of life he brought instead of all forms of mode of ethics instead of all forms of code of lives this is the basic purpose why prophets were sent towards people and then in verse number 65 allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says fala wa rabbika la yu'minun فلا وربك لا يؤمنون حتى يحكموك فيما شجر بينهم ثم لا يجد في انفسهم حرجا مما قضيت ويسلم تسليما but now no by your lord allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is swearing and saying that no they will not believe they will not believe till when until they make you you means what muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam they will not believe that they will not be true believers until they make muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam judge concerning over what or over which they dispute among themselves and then find within themselves no discomfort from what they have judged and submit in full willing submission so in verse number 65 allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is actually swearing by his name allah is swearing by his name and allah is saying that there is absolutely not possible it is not possible that that person may be considered as a believer in the eyes of allah allah will not consider that person as a believer who does what until and unless he makes the decisions of his life according to the teachings of prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he makes he makes the teachings of prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam as a judge in his life whenever he has to make a decision in his life he takes guidance and counsels from the teachings of sunna and hadith and then what he gets from there he he accepts them he submits to them and he submits to them willingly completely in total submission without any regrets then only can he be considered as a muslim as a believer in the eyes of allah you know we throughout our lives and we from morning to evening we are continuously making decisions aren't we like should i wear this or shouldn't i should i eat this or shouldn't i should i go to this gathering or party or shouldn't i should i should i make my business dealings or should i shouldn't i should i accept the proposal for my sister or for my daughter or should i give the right of inheritance to my daughters or my sisters or shouldn't i should i give dowry to my daughter or my sister or shouldn't i should i take loan on riba or shouldn't i these are all decisions which we are continuously making in our lives throughout the day throughout our lives so now to be a believer to be a true believer and to be able to perfect our belief what do we need to do we need to make these decisions in the light of what Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam has taught us in hadith and sunnah and what we get from hadith and sunnah for these decisions we should without being any any having any doubt being 
any form indecisive being in any form without being doubtful without being uncomfortable we should we should accept them with the full willing heart and soul and submit to them you sallimu taslima you submit to them with total submission with total surrendering and feel no re- regrets after doing so so this is what is going to make a person a true believer in the eyes of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so here we learn today what the importance of obeying the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam now today i shall be basically talking about the belief on prophethood because for salvation on the day of judgment for salvation of the bondsmen two things are needed you know a perfect faith or belief and the second is right deeds deeds right these deeds being the deeds as are explained by quran and hadith and sunnah now for faith and belief we we need to what faith and belief has to be perfected in five aspects and by some scholars even in six aspects i've talked about it previously when i was talking about the concept of oneness of allah but let's repeat five aspects of faith or belief are belief in allah belief in the day of judgment believe in the angels believe in the holy books or the divine scriptures believe in the prophets or the messengers of allah and the sixth being believe in fate or destiny that is good or bad so the first and the primary belief we need a very important belief for the completion and perfection of belief is to believe in the prophets and in the books revealed to them and witnessing this belief is basically a pillar of islam and it, it is the basic foundation of islam as hazrat abdullah bin umar radiyallahu ta'ala who reports in bukhari that prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said buni al islam ala khamsin shahadatan an la ilaha illallah ومحمدًا عبده ورسوله إقام الصلاة وإيتاء الزكاة والحج والصوم رمضان The foundation of Islam is on five things witnessing that there is no god but Allah and Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is the servant and messenger of Allah and establishing the salah and paying the zakah and performing the hajj and fasting in the month of Ramadan So the first pillar of Islam and the basic primary foundation of Islam is witnessing and believing in the prophets. So now I shall be talking about this and the different concepts and the different aspects about the belief in prophethood because without this without this being perfect we will not be a muslim we will not be a believer and there will be no salvation. So how are we supposed to believe in the prophets and what is the faith of prophethood actually There are different concepts about it the first concept is to believe in all the prophets As Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Baqarah verse 4 Allah says yu'minuna bima unzila ilayka wa ma unzila min qablika wa bil akhirati hum yuqinun that they believe in what was revealed to the prophets of Allah alayhi salam and what was revealed before to the prophets before him and they also believe in the day of resurrection and how do we believe in the prophets is in all the prophets as allah mentions in verse 126 of surah al-baqarah and verse 89 of surah al-imran allah says la yufarriquna bayna ahadin minhum wa nahnu lahu muslimun that all muslims who are believing in all the prophets they are supposed to declare and announce that they do what they should say that we do not differentiate among the prophets we do not differentiate between the prophets and we call ourselves as muslims so that is what is needed in believing all the 
prophets is to believe all of them and do not differentiate between all of them. What does this exactly mean and imply? This means that the person will believe that all the prophets were actually the messengers or prophets of Allah. They were chosen for revelation and we will believe in all of them. We should love, respect and regard all of them. But as far as obeying and following is concerned, that will be specifically related to the hadith and sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu as it is only his teachings. The teachings of Prophet Sallallahu hadith and sunnah which are secured, which are perfected, which are the final, which are the ultimate and which are complete. Love, respect, regard of all, love, respect, regard, belief and faith on all without differentiation, without distinction, but obedience and, and uh, accepting the orders and following the sunnah will be our Prophet Now here before proceeding, I would want to clarify in other things that uh, the messengers and prophets of Allah are basically in two categories. They can be, uh, they could be a Nabi. A Nabi, Nabi comes from the word Naba. Naba means news. So Nabi was the person who used to, whom Allah chose out of his bondsmen and revelations were sent to him. And this Nabi or the prophet gave the news of the revolution and commandments of Allah to the people. And then the second category is the Rasul. Rasul was a person whom Allah chose from among the bondsmen. Revolutions were sent down to the Rasul. But in addition, the Rasul of the messengers were also given a holy book or a holy scripture. So this is the basic difference between a Nabi or a prophet and a Rasul or a messenger. Messengers were given holy books or divine scriptures, but the prophets or the Anbiya were just given, just given the revelations. And moreover, the Rasul or the Rusul, they also brought a new Sharia. And because of these two reasons that the Rasul brought a new Sharia and the Rasul was given a holy book, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promised to protect and safeguard the lives of the Rasuls and not so regarding the Anbiya. That is why Allah says, The followers of the Anbiya did murder them, but no follower of the Rasul was allowed to do that because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had taken the charge of protecting the Rasul. And so if I may say, you, you may understand that all Ambiya are not Rusul, but all Rusul are Ambiya. There are four Rusul may, uh, mentioned in the Quran. Hazrat Ibrahim alayhi salam Khalilullah, as his scripture is mentioned in Quran is Suhuf Ibrahim of Musa. Then Hazrat Musa alayhi salam Allah mentions giving Hazrat Musa alayhi salam Torah or the Old Testament. And then Hazrat Da'ud alayhi salam wa atayna Da'ud as Sabura. Zabur was the holy scripture which was revealed to Hazrat Da'ud alayhi salam. And then Hazrat Isa alayhi salam was given Injil or the New Testament. And then Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was given or was revealed the Quran. So five Rusul have been mentioned in the Quran. And then another five category of five Ulul Azam Ambiya. Five Ulul Azam Ambiya are the five steadfast prophets. And the top of the line is Hazrat Nu alayhi salam because he was the one who with full perseverance and steadfastness was preaching and was teaching the 
message of Allah to his people for full 950 years in his life. And then in this Ulul Azam Anbiya, we have Hazrat Ibrahim alayhi salam, Hazrat Musa alayhi salam, Hazrat Isa alayhi salam, and Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So the next thing or the next aspect, the first thing which I told about or I've talked about in the belief of prophethood is that we need to believe in all the messengers on the prophets and we do not have to make any distinction or differentiation between all of them. The second aspect of the belief of prophethood is to believe that all the prophets or messengers were humans or humans. Allah says in Surah Kahf verse 110 and Surah Fussilat verse number 6, قُلْ إِنَّمَا أَنَا بَشْرٌ مِثْلُكُمْ إِنَّمَا يُوحَى إِلَيَّا إِنَّمَا إِلَاهُكُمْ إِلَاهُ وَاحِدٌ قُلْ You say, you announce that there is absolutely no doubt that I am a human like you. The only difference is what? That I have... I have been revealed that I have been sent a revolution that there is no God but Allah. So what does this mean and what does this imply? That all the prophets were physically, emotionally, socially, psychologically very, very much humans. Like the body structure. Physically, all the body structure, the skin, the muscles, the joints, the bones, the organs were like human beings. Then, because of this, all their physical needs were like, very much like human beings. They would get tired. They would need sleep and rest. They would, they would feel hunger and thirst and so would need to drink and eat. They would... They would suffer from fever. They would experience pain. They would be injured. Their bodies would ache. They would cry. So all this was human. Emotionally, there were times they were happy. There were times they were sad. There were times they were anxious. There were times when they were upset. There were times they were crying. There were times when they were laughing. So emotionally, they were humans. And socially also, they were humans. They had social needs, needs of human relationships. So they, they needed and then they were provided with parents, with siblings, with spouse, with children, with daughters, with sons. So I sum up again that all the prophets are the messengers of Allah were physically, emotionally, socially, psychologically. They were very much human. But the only, the only and the biggest and the only difference was that they were chosen by Allah for prophethood and hence they were they were given revelations and this is what make them different as compared to the rest of the bondsmen and this is what made them superior to the normal bondsmen so this is the second concept we need to accept and to believe when we believe in the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now why must we believe the prophets to be humans? The first thing will be that once the prophets are considered as humans, then this will prevent the followers to consider them as an ilah. To raise them to the ranks of Allah. This will be prevented. Polytheism, polytheism of the of the prophets, finding the prophets as partners with Allah in his being, making them his sons, or making them as a part of Allah, this will be prevented if we consider them as human beings. Like like the Jews and the Christians saying, وَقَالَتِ الْيَحُودُ وَزَيْرِ بْنُ اللَّهِ وَقَالَتِ النَّسَارَ عِيْسَى بْنُ اللَّهِ This was because they raised the level and the rank of their prophets above a human being. And then they raised the level of their prophets to the, to the rank of Allah. The second thing why it is important is that when they are considered as human beings, another positive effect will be that we know that all prophets, they acted 
completely and totally according to the commandments of Allah. And they they obeyed all the do's and don'ts of Allah. And so they were the human models of the teachings of Allah. Now, if they were considered humans, what would happen? That thinking that they were humans, if they could do that, anybody could do that. And all the commandments of Allah and do's and don'ts of Allah are very, very much humanly possible to be accepted and obeyed upon. But if on the contrary, they are considered as some supermen or some superhuman, or they have, they are considered to have some supernatural things in them, then people would very easily say that being a superhuman or being a superman, they could obey all the commandments. And it was just possible for them because the superhumans and it is not possible for the normal human beings. And so escaping from obeying all the commandments of Allah would be very easy despite seeing the actual human role models of the prophets themselves. So this is one reason why Allah orders us to consider all prophets normal human beings and explains as the only difference that they were given revelations. The third concept we need to understand in the belief of prophethood is the concept of the seal of prophets. The concept of seal of prophethood is explained in Surah Al-Ahzab. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, مَا كَانَ مُحَمَّدٌ أَبَا أَحَدٍ مِنْ رِجَالِكُمْ وَلَكِنْ وَلَكِنْ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ بَخَوْتَمَ النَّبِيِّينَ وَكَانَ اللَّهُ بِكُلِّ شَيْءٍ أَلِيمًا Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is not the father of any one of you men, but he is the messenger of Allah and the seal of the prophets of Allah. Allah is indeed, Allah is indeed all knowing of everything. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is calling Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as the seal of prophethoods. And similarly, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam himself also said, La nabi ba'di wa la ummatan ba'di kum. There will be no prophet or no messenger after me, and there will be no followers of any prophet after you. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is called as Khatimul Mursaleen, Khatimun Nabiyyin. Neither will there be any nabi, nor there will be any rasul after Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. No prophet, no messenger, no revelation. And that is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Maidah. الْيَوْمَ أَكْمَلْتُ لَكُمْ دِينُكُمْ وَأَتْمَمْتُ عَلَيْكُمْ نِعْمَتِي وَرَذِيتُ لَكُمُ الْإِسْلَامَ الدِّينَ These verses were like one of the last verses which were revealed on the Prophet ﷺ during his sermon of uh, the farewell hajj he performed. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala very clearly announced in one of these last verses which were revealed to the Prophet sallallahu that today I have perfected and completed for you your religion and I have completed my blessings or bounties on you and I have chosen Islam as a religion for you. So now I repeat no prophets, no messengers, no books, no revelation. What will be the essential implications of believing the concept of seal of prophets. The first implication, when we, when we accept the concept of the seal of prophethood, the first concept would be to very clearly understand, to understand in black and white, then anyone who, even if he believes in the prophethood of Prophet Sallallahu that anyone, despite believing in the prophethood of Prophet Sallallahu if he believes in any other person after him as a prophet or a messenger, then his belief or faith in prophethood is not correct, it is not perfect, and so he is not a believer. Any person 
believing any other person other than Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and after Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as being a prophet or as being a messenger of Allah will not be a believer, will not be a Muslim and he would not he should not be expecting salvation on the day of resurrection. The second implication of this concept of seal of prophethood is very important for all of us to understand. From this we have very clearly understand, understood that there will be no messenger or prophet of Allah now coming to spread the message and the words of Allah. So now who will be doing all this? This is what we need to realize. This is what we actually need to realize from the depth of our hearts. That this duty, we need to realize this duty with, with intense commitment that this is now the duty of the followers of the Prophet ﷺ to spread the message of Allah to his bondsmen. Since no prophet is going to come, no, no messenger is going to come and they are not going to spread the teaching. So it is for the followers of the last prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, us, kuntum khaira ummatin. It is for us to very, very intensely feel this responsibility that it is for us to spread the teachings of Quran and Sunnah. And spread the teachings of Quran and Sunnah to whom, where, Till which limit? You know what? Allah calls in the Quran, Ya ayyuhan nas. Allah does not just call in the Quran the believers, the followers of Prophet Sallallahu No. The call of Allah, the invite of the Quran is to Ya ayyuhan nas, O people of the world. So this is our duty to spread to all the people of the world the teachings of Quran and Hadith. What an immense task. What an immense task and a huge, huge commitment has to be accomplished. Do we ever realize this? Do we ever think? Do we ever bother? Do we ever concentrate on this? The callosity of our duty as a Muslim or as a believer? Now, if thinking all this, let's just analyze the actual state of affairs. Just look around ourselves. Statistically try to analyze a few questions which I would be giving you to analyze and look around yourselves. How many people around you? How many people around you amongst the Muslims recite Quran? How many people around us, they read Hadith? How many people who are reading Quran are actually understanding, understanding and comprehending the meaning of Quran? What percentage, what percentage of people around us has gone through the message, the complete message of Quran? Believe you me. Very sadly and very pathetically, you would realize that not even 2%, 2% of the literate, educated class of the Muslims of today are doing or they have done what I have talked about. So do we realize the colossity of the job that has to be completed before we depart? And do we know what period is left for us? before we depart for us to complete this job, to complete this task, life is uncertain. And the task is so immense. What are we doing? Where are we spending our time, our money, our capacities, our potentials? We have all the time in the world we have all the time in the world to go around the shopping malls just doing winter shopping. People of today, Muslims of today, they have all the time in the world to get bored. Really getting bored with so much to be done? Allah, help us set bigger targets. 
set bigger goals, look at bigger aims to achieve in our life. And Allah help us feel the callosity of the job and the duty we are supposed and expected to perform before we depart. And the third concept which after believing the seal of prophethood is that we all need to be clear that since no prophet, no messenger, no revelation, no order and commandments of Allah brought by Hazrat Jibreel alayhi salam now. So very clearly no saint, no scholar, no religious leader can claim now to have the right to alter, to abrogate the final verdict, the perfected commandments of Allah. No one can annul or alter the laws or the orders of Quran and Sunnah because there is a seal of prophethood now. Now, talking about all this, the next thing I would want to talk about is why were prophets sent? The prophets were sent to guide the bondsmen. As Allah says clearly in this verse 64 and 65, why the prophets were sent to be obeyed, to be accepted. You know, Allah says in Quran, Hadayna hunna jadain. Allah says that we've shown, we've showed and we've guided the people both towards both the paths. Which are the both paths? The path which is a slope, which is rolling down towards the hellfire. It seems very easy to roll downwards and it seems very easy to move downhill, but, but the end is the hellfire. And then Allah has shown us the steep climb. The steep uphill climb to the Jannah, it climbing up hill and especially climbing the steep mountains is definitely difficult. It is exhausting, it is tiring, but the reward is Jannah. So Allah says, we've guided them to both the paths. And how has Allah guided his bondsmen? towards the path is that he from amongst the bondsmen chose people to be the prophets and messengers, sent down to revelations, gave them the holy books and the scriptures to guide them and through them the bondsmen. And then Allah made these prophets and these messengers as the human models, the human models, the models of excellence for all the guidance which was sent. The prophets were actually the human models of all the guidance sent to them by the revolutions of Allah. For example, if I would make you understand the whole thing very easily, that why we need to follow and how merciful Allah was sending us these prophets and messengers. See if like you were to go to a place, an unknown place where you've never been and you don't even know the way to get to that place. What do you normally do? We get to a person who knows the place and say if we come across a person, the first person he just tells us orally or verbally and guides us that you go on that road and you take the second or the third left turn and then you take the third left turn and then you see the uh, a signboard and you see a building and he just gives us the signs and he gives us the turnings and he names us the roads and he just verbally explains the whole path. And then there's another person who verbally or orally does explain the whole whole route but actually draws up and makes a road map and sketches and then hands it over to us that you keep on following this, it'll be easy for you to get to your point. And then there's a third person he first tries to explain it verbally by, by his word of mouth. And then when he thinks that we are just really empty minded, if we're not catching, then he draws a road map and a sketch, hands it over to us. And then when he still sees us empty faced or lost, then he, he tells us, OK, fine, I'll guide you. you. You come behind me. I'll ride in front of you. I come in my car. You follow my car and I'll get you there. Now, who would you relate to? 
Just tell me, would you relate to the first person? No. Not to the second person? Oh, yes, no, never. But obviously you would relate to the third person. Because he's explained, he has given you the map, and he is actually acting as a guide to get you to your to your desired destination. This is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has done. He sent us the revelations. Then he gave us the books, which were the road maps and the guides to Jannah. And then he has said that having this road map, even despite having this road map to Jannah, if you cannot understand, if you cannot comprehend, if you are doubtful in certain situations, and if you are confused and if you are not clear, then these are the human models of this road map. And these are the models of the prophets. And these are the models of the messengers. And these are the human models of the revelations of the Quran. And then Allah orders لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنَةٌ حَسَنَةٌ إِنْ سُرَةٌ أَحْزَابٌ That for you, surely for you, is in the model of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam a model of excellence. And then throughout Quran, Allah says so many times, أَتِيُوا اللَّهُ وَأَتِيُوا رَسُولُ أَتِيُوا اللَّهُ وَأَتِيُوا رَسُولُ Obey Allah and obey the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But despite all that, despite all that, this Mercy of Allah, this mercy of Allah of sending the books and sending the human models of those books, there are people who are crooked enough, who are rebellious enough, who are averse to the teachings of the prophets. You might have come across people who say that we will just, we will just connect to Quran, we'll just resort to the Quran and we will not resort and link ourselves to hadith and sunnah and then they have their they have their arguments for them people who refuse to believe to the teachings of hadith and sunnah people who are averse to the message of sunnah they have their own arguments what are their arguments the disbelievers of hadith the refusers of sunnah what are their arguments the first and the primary argument is that Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had, had stopped people from writing the hadith. During the period of Makkah, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had stopped the people from writing hadith and putting it down and penning it up. So hadith was not written. All the teachings of hadith and the mannerism of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Sunnah was never written down in the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And not only this, they say that the teachings and the words of Hadith and Sunnah, they were remote. They were not written. They were not compiled. And they were all forgotten. And they were all and redundant for full like two to three hundred years. And it was like after full three hundred years, that hadith and sunnah was compiled and so because of that that it was forgotten it was left it was redundant it was not written down it was not compiled for full 300 years and after 300 years since it was compiled so it is not perfect it is not secure it is not complete and it is not 100% correct. And that is why we doubt in it. And that is why we just resort to Quran. Now I would need to explain how the whole things went about. There is absolutely no doubt that there are, there are words of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in just the initial period of Mecca where Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam stopped the companions to write. But there are just one or two such occasions when Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam reported incorrect words of Hadith did stop his companions to write. But this was just in the initial period of Mecca. And why did he stop was because this was just the start. They were not well versed. They were not well versed. They were not acquainted with the language of Quran and even with the Hadith. And if they started to write Quran as well as Hadith simultaneously at the same time, when it was all very new to them, 
then everything would have been like jumbled up and Quran and Hadith would have been all mixed up. So in the very, very initial stages, Prophet ﷺ did stop the companions to write. But when? When they were well versed with writing of the verses of Quran and memorizing the verses of Quran, then there are so many incidents. There are so many occasions in the life of Prophet ﷺ that he actually ordered. He actually ordered them to write. And then he got it written himself. Like Hazrat Abu Huraira who had a remarkable memory. And when he used to hear the words of Prophet Wasallam, he used to memorize them. And companions used to come complaining to the Prophet Wasallam of their short, shortness of their memory that they could not remember the words of Hadith as, as properly as Hazrat Abu Huraira used to. And Prophet Wasallam used to instruct them to write it down. For a better memory, Prophet used to ask them, instruct them, and order them to write down the words of Hadith. A person came over to Prophet from the Kabila of Homer, from the tribe of Homer, and he asked Prophet about the drink which I was talking about just the last day, the intoxicating drink. And Prophet told him that it was forbidden. And he said that I will accept because I've heard it with my own ears and I'm a witness to what you've told me. But when I take these orders to the to the people of my tribe, they will they will not accept it. And then Prophet asked the companions, Uktubuli Abisha, put it down, write it down, write these orders for Abusha. So then because of this, the previous words of the hadith number one are annulled and abrogated. The hadith where Prophet stopped them does not hold and did not hold even in the life of the Prophet And so during the life of Prophet as Quran was written and memorized, so was Hadith written and memorized. Many companions starting from Hazrat Abu Huraira anhu, to Hazrat Ali anhu, they used to write Hadith. And they are Sahifas. They, they had their notebooks. Sahifai Ali, Sahifai Hazrat Abu Huraira, which Hazrat Hamam bin Munabahi used this Sahifa of Hazrat Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu to compile Sahifai Hamam bin Munabba. And then Hazrat Abdullah bin Masood and so many companions of the Prophet sallallahu they used to write hadith. And all these companions, they wrote with intense honesty and full sensitivity because they knew that Prophet sallallahu has said, Man faqad nar. That anyone who, who, know, who knowingly, intentionally, who intentionally, knowingly fabricated falsehood with me will make his seat in hell fire. So they were extremely sensitive. They were, they were intensely honest to write down the words of Hadith. And then the period next after the companions, after the Sahaba Ikram, were the Tabayin and the Taba Tabayin. The period of Tabayin and the period of Taba Tabayin is well known that from morning till evening were, were they calling out, call Allah wa call Rasulullah, that Allah has said this and Prophet has said this. This was the period where memorizers of Hadith were very, very common. And then it was in this period of Taba Tabain, which is like 200 years after the death of Prophet ﷺ, that Imam Malik compiled Mota Imam Malik. And this Mota Imam Malik is present till now. And this was written down. This was written down from all the informations and all the compilations of the companions of the Tabayin and of the Taba Tabayin that Imam Malik compiled his Mota Imam Malik. And this Mota Imam Malik was the major source of the basic big books of Hadith which was written in the period after this. May it be Bukhari, Muslim, Tirmizi, Ibn Majah, Nisai, Mustad Ahmad, Abu Daud. The basic source was Mota Imam Malik. So no hadith and no sunnah was lost 
are redundant and then taken after three centuries to be compiled. No, they were continuously written, they were continuously memorized, and they were continuously saved down and put down in notebooks and sakifas. And moreover, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself, he says, Allah says, we have revealed this zikr, and we ourselves shall protect and keep it secured. So if Allah announces and promises to keep God, to keep secure the Quran, then how how is it possible that he would leave the model of the Quran that is Hadith and Sunnah unattended and insecure? Quran, Hadith, Sunnah are all secure, all complete and all perfect. And then you know what? I would I can easily go challenging the people who just say that we will believe in just the Quran and we will not believe in Hadith and Sunnah. You can very easily ask them that if you just relate to Quran, how can you understand and comprehend Quran without Hadith and Sunnah? Quran can only be understood, comprehended and be acted upon in perfection when it is related with Hadith and Sunnah. Like if you're just talking about Salah in in Islam, we're just talking about Salah. What does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talk about Salah in Quran? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Akimu Salata, establish your prayers, establish your Salah. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, That is the order and the commandment for the congregational prayers of Salah. And then Allah says, Hafiz wa Salawat, take care of your Salah, protect your Salah. This is almost like all what Allah says about Salah. How, when, where, how are we going to recite? What are we going to recite when we are standing, when we are prostrating, when we are bowed down, when we are in at the shahad? When we cannot learn and we cannot offer our Salah or establish our Salah just by relating with Quran only, and we need to connect with Hadith and Sunnah to explain all these concepts of the Salah. Similarly about purity, Allah, Prophet ﷺ said, al-Iman, purity is half of faith, half of belief. Now, all the methods of purifying, like wudu, like the bath, or tayammum, the exact procedure, the exact method, the exact steps, we learn from the Quran? No. In complete guidance, it is from the Hadith and Sunnah. So if about these two basic, primary, preliminary things of Islam, we need to connect to Hadith and Sunnah and just connecting to Quran, we cannot completely act. Then how can we complete and how can we acquire full guidance for Quran about the whole of Islam? Now, the next thing which I would need to clarify is that what was the source of Hadith and Sunnah? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَا يَنْتِقُ عَنِ الْحَوَىٰ إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا وَحْيٌ يُوْحَىٰ that Prophet ﷺ did not converse or talk with his will other than only what was revealed to him in his revelations. So according to this verse, the source of Hadith and Sunnah were the revelations which were brought to Prophet ﷺ through Hazrat Jibreel ﷺ. Similarly, Prophet ﷺ himself said, Inni utitul Qur'ana there is absolutely no doubt, there is surely no doubt that I have been given the Qur'an and something similar to it with it. And what is similar to it with it is Hadith and Sunnah. Now, how did all this happen? When Hazrat Jibreel salam, came down and he brought a revolution of the verses of Qur'an to the Prophet wasallam, he recited it. And then it was entered into the memory of Prophet ﷺ in the Quran. 
Then he used to come as a teacher of the companions and he used to recite the revealed verses. He used to recite the revealed verses. He used to teach them the revealed verses and he used to make them write it down, put it down. Different ways of writing, inshallah, we'll be talking about them in future. And then the companions used to write them down and they used to memorize the verses which were revealed at that occasion. These verses which were put in the memory of Prophet and the companions, which was recited by the Prophet as the verses of Quran and by the companions as the verses of Quran and which were written down by the companions as the verses of Quran. These have been called as the revealed revelations to the Prophet. These were the recited revelations to the Prophet Beyond this, there was another set of revelations which are called as the concealed or the hidden or the non-recited revelations to the Prophet What was this? After the verses were revealed, by Hazrat Jibrail to Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, then Hazrat Jibrail Alaihi Salam used to explain the revealed verses, explained all the commandments of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, used to explain these revealed verses in the words of Allah to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. These explanations by Jibrail Alaihi Salam which were not in his own words. These descriptions of those verses, these explanations of those verses were strictly in the words of Allah. These words of Allah were not written down as verses of Quran. These verses of Allah, words of Allah were not recited as verses of Quran or were not memorized as the verses of Quran. They were the concealed, they were the hidden, they were the non-recited revelations and these were these were taught to the companions by the Prophet ﷺ when he taught that is as hadith and when he acted that is as sunnah so there it is if I summarize now that the source of hadith and sunnah was through hidden revelations and hence, the source of Quran, the source of Hadith and Sunnah is all through revelations. And this is all zikr. And Allah has taken charge of keeping and protecting and securing all forms of zikr. May it be the Quran, may it be Hadith and may it be Sunnah. So Quran, Hadith and Sunnah are complete. They are perfect. They are safe, they are secure, and they can all be acted upon, and they have to be all acted upon. That is why Allah here has clearly told us that a person who does not act according to the teachings of Quran and Hadith will not be a believer. Repeatedly. So many places and verses and surahs and Quran does Allah orders all the believers to obey Allah and to obey Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Hazrat Anas radiallahu ta'ala and who reports in Bukhari that Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, whoever avoids following my way does not belong to me. So if we want to be among the followers. We need to obey the teachings of Hadith and Sunnah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Anfal, verse number 20, Ya ayyuhal lazina amanu, atiyu allaha wa atiyu rasuluhu, wa la tawallaw anhum, wa la tawallaw anhu wa antum tasma'oon. O oh, believers, obey Allah and His Messenger and turn, do not turn away from Him when you have heard. So after hearing, after listening to the teachings of Quran and to the teachings of Hadith and Sunnah, if you turn around, this is forbidden by the teachings or by the message of Quran. Then Allah says, 
In Surah An-Nisa, verse number 18, inshallah, we'll be talking about it soon. Allah says, May you take Allah, may you take Rasulah, Fakat atwa Allah, wa man tawalla, fama arusalnaka alayhim hafizwa. He who obeys the messenger actually obeys Allah. So, obeying Allah has been conditioned, has been conditioned with obedience of the Prophet If anybody obeys Allah, if anybody obeys the Prophet then only will he be obeying Allah. And if anybody is disobeying Prophet then he will not be obeying Allah, he will be disobeying Allah. He who obeys the messenger obeys Allah. But if anyone turns away, we have not sent you to watch over them. So, to be obedient to Prophet is to be obedient to Allah. Then Allah says in Surah Nisa, verse number 64, uh, in, uh, in Surah Al Imran, verse 132, Allah says, wa turhamun. Obey Allah and obey His Messenger so that you may obtain mercy. So if we want that the merciful Allah be merciful on us, then in addition to Allah, Prophet ﷺ has to be obeyed. Allah says in Surah Muhammad verse 33, Ya ayyuhallazina amanu atiyu Allah wa atiyu rasula wa la tubtilu a'malakum. O believers, obey Allah and obey the messenger and do not waste your deeds. So deeds... If they are in a state of disobedience to the Prophet all their deeds will go in vain. They will be wasted. They'll all go down the train if the person is disobeying the Messenger of Allah. How do we obey Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam? Surah Hashr, verse fifty-nine. Allah subhanahu wa taala says, "Wa ma atakum al-Rasul fakhuzhu, wa ma nahaqum anhu thantahu. Wattaqullah inna Allah shadid al-iqab." Take what the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam gives you and refrain from what he prohibits you and fear Allah, for Allah is very severe in his punishment. Surah Nur verse 52 Allah says wa may yuti Allah wa rasuluhu wa yakhsha Allah wa yattaqi fa ulaika humul fa'izun who obey Allah and his messenger and fear Allah and they do right that is they fear Allah they will be those who will be successful Allahumma ja'alna minhum Allah make us one of those then in Surah Ahzab, verse 71, Allah says, وَمَنْ يُطِعِ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ فَقَدْ فَاذَ ثَوْزًا عَزْوِيمًا Superlative success. You want superlative success? You want the greatest victory? Then do what? Whoever obeys Allah and his messenger will attain the greatest victory of all. Then, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala where he clearly announces and highlights in Surah Al-Imran, verse 31. What will we gain when we obey the Prophet ﷺ? We'll gain the mercy of Allah. We will be out of those who are successful. We will gain the, we will gain the ultimate victory. And then what will we gain? Allah says in Surah Al-Imran, verse 31, قُلْ إِن كُنْتُمْ تُحِبُّونَ اللَّهِ فَاتَّبِعُونِي يُحْبِكُمُ اللَّهِ وَيَغْفِرْ لَكُمْ ذَنُوبُكُمْ وَاللَّهُ غَفُورٌ رَّحِيمٌ Say that if you love Allah, follow me. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, tell, tell your followers that if they claim, that if they announce that they love Allah, then they should follow, they should follow the teachings of the Sunnah of his beloved Prophet. And if you will follow the teachings and the sunnah of the beloved prophet, then what will Allah do? Allah will love you. You follow his beloved prophet, then he will start loving you. And then he will forgive your sins. For Allah is all forgiving and merciful. So you want, you want and we want that we, our sins be forgiven and that we be one of the beloved ones of Allah. Then what do we need to do? We need to follow the sunnah. We need to obey the teachings of hadith. And we shall be coming across this verse, inshallah, in Surah An-Nisa, verse number 69. 
Allah has promised, "Wa may yuti Allah wa Rasula, faulai kama alzina an amallah alaihim min al nabiyina wa sudikina wa shukada wa swalihina wa hasuna ulai ka rafika." Who obey Allah and His messengers will be in the company of those whom, of the prophets, of the truthful, of the martyrs, of the swalihin. And how beautiful is this company anybody can have? And then Allah warns, Surah Al Imran, verse thirty-two. Allah warns, "Qul ati Allah wa Rasulah, fa inta wallo, fa inna Allah la yuhibul kafirin." Obey Allah and His Messenger, but if they turn back, Allah does not love who reject faith. So, a person will be entitled to the love of Allah if he obeys the Prophet, and a person will be deprived of the love of Allah if he refuses to obey the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allah says in verse in verse seventeen of Surah Al Fat, "Wa may yuti Allah wa Rasuluhu yudqilhu jannat in tajrim in tahtih al anqaru, wa may yatawalla yu'athibhu athaban alima." Those who will obey Allah and His messengers, Allah will admit them into the jannah beneath which rivers will be flowing, and who will turn back. Who will turn back? Turn back to what? To obeying the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allah will punish him with the grievous punishments of the hell. And then Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has asked us to obey himself. Hazrat Abu Huraira radiyallahu ta'ala who reports in Bukhari that Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "Kullu ummatin yadkhuluna al-jannah illa man aba." Kullu ummatin all the followers of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam will enter enter the paradise except those who do what? Aba, who deny. The companions asked, "Wa man ya aba?" Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam who would refuse to enter the paradise? Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, "Man atwaani taqal al Janna, wa man aswaani fakad aba." Whoever obeyed me will enter the Janna, and whoever disobeyed me has actually denied me, has has denied to enter into Janna. Hazrat Abu Huraira رضي الله تعالى عنه reports in Muslim that Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, "Man atwaani fakad atwa Allah, wa man yaxni fakad aswa Allah." Whoever obeys me has obeyed Allah. Whoever disobeys me has disobeyed Allah. Then Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "None of you will have will have completed his faith till your soul surrenders to what I have brought." That is the teaching of Sunnah and Hadith. Then Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has been reported. Hazrat Abu Ibn Abbas was the Allah who Taala who reports that Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that I am leaving to you. And then Hazrat Abu Huraira was the Allah who Taala who also reports the same words. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, "Inni tarak tu fi kum shay'an, lanta zulu dahta huma kitab Allah wa sunnati. I am leaving with you two things behind me for all of you. If you act upon them." You will never go astray. One is the book of Allah, and other is my Sunnah. So these are the two things we need to abide by if we want to be steadfast on the path of Jannah. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was supplicating in his farewell sermon, and he was saying, as Abd al-Rahman reports in Ibn Majah, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said. نظر الله عمر سمع منا حديثا may Allah keep the man hale and hearty may Allah keep the man hale and hearty who listened to a sunnah from us and forwarded to others because invariably a person who received it will have better memory than who listens to it so spreading the teachings of hadith prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam has supplicated for all those people Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala let us let us understand remember and comprehend what we all heard today let us let us one of let us be one of those who believe in all what we heard today let us one let us be one of those who act 
according to the teachings of Quran, Hadith and Sunnah. O Allah, the merciful, make us one of those who steadfastly hold to the teachings of Quran, Hadith and Sunnah. Allahumma inni as'aluka hubbaka wa hubba man yuhibbuka wa amala allazi yuballighuni hubbaka. Allahumma rahmatika arju fala takilni ila nafsi min tarfata aynin wa aslihni shakni kullahu la ilaha illa anta. Allahumma alhimna rushdan wa aizna min shururi anfusina. ربنا لا تزغ قلوبنا بعد إذ خديتنا وحب لنا ملة الرحمة إنك أنت الوهاب سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك نشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت نستغفرك ونتوب إليك سبحان ربك رب العزة يما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين آمين سمامين